Welcome to any new members. I'm told there's at least one new member in the audience, our secretary tells me, so welcome to he. Um, as usual, I'll make the parish notices first, and then we'll uh, give our undivided attention to our speaker. Uh, they're fairly brief, because having got through a fairly hectic summer, uh, there's not quite so much to bring to your attention. Um, our next meeting here uh, in four weeks' time uh, is Chris Nix, the uh, Assistant Director at the Museum, who's had a particular input into the development of the Hidden London Programme. Um, and Chris, who spoke to us a couple of years ago in the very early days of that programme, uh, is going to uh, bring us up to date with uh, what's been happening with the Hidden London Tours. Um, it was the last meeting that Chris addressed that first got us into the problem of having very large attendances. Um, so we thought it a prudent measure to actually ask Chris to deliver that talk twice. So he's doing it, as I say, on Monday the 6th of November here as the usual Monday evening arrangement. But then later that month, on Thursday the 23rd of November, he's going to repeat it at Acton Depot in the afternoon. As far as I'm aware, it will be uh, the same talk, um, to all intents and purposes. Uh, so we will put both of those meetings on the website, hopefully tomorrow, uh, so that you can book if you wish to come. Um, but I ask you, given that it is going to be a popular talk, to book for one or other. Um, don't become a hidden London groupie and try and uh, come to both, um, to allow the maximum number to, um, uh, to get the benefit of what Chris is going to say. Uh, and then just to look a little bit further ahead, on Monday the 27th of November, uh, our last meeting before Christmas, which is coming, would you believe, um, Peter Newman uh, from Ensign Bus is going to talk to us. Um, there are two visits in the pipeline, one which is coming up this coming weekend, uh, and which the bookings therefore uh, have closed, is our murder mystery weekend. Uh, and slapped and sands and various other things uh, by way of Devon uh, places of interest. Uh, one you have not yet had details of but will be in the next magazine, which is the now annual Christmas lunch excursion, which, and you might like to make a note if you're interested in that, uh, will take place this year on Saturday the 9th of December, uh, and we are being taken to the North Norfolk Railway by coach uh, for uh, a Christmas lunch uh, on that uh, poppy line. Um, we're going by coach for no better reason than um, it was reckoned that the train was likely to be a single car DMU from Norwich to Sherring, um, which might have trouble accommodating everybody. Now, now that leads me to say um, something which is rather sad in that Mike Kay uh, is not very well, not very well at all at the moment. Uh, and is actually in hospital in uh, South End, uh, and we have already expressed uh, on our collective behalfs uh, our best wishes uh, to him for a recovery. Um, it does mean that some of the plans which Mike was working on are at the moment in abeyance, and I think I should say that that is almost certainly going to cause a postponement of the projected far-flung visit to Australia this time next year, because Mike is in no fit state to pursue those arrangements at the moment. I am assured by those who work with Mike uh, that there is absolutely no problem uh, in the delivery either of the uh, Devon weekend, this coming weekend, or the Christmas lunch. All of those arrangements are well in place, uh, and there will be no difficulty with that. Uh, but Mike, who is a, a great stalwart, I think has um, suddenly discovered that um, you can take on too much, um, which is largely what I think the root cause of the, the problem is. So we wish Mike well. Um, hopefully there will be more of his excursions next year, um, but I don't think that will include Australia. But when we're absolutely certain about that, uh, we'll let everybody know. Right, that's all I have to say, I think, uh, other than to introduce our speaker. Um, except I probably don't need to, for two reasons. Uh, one, you know who he is, you know probably a lot about his background, uh, which is as a transport enthusiast originally, but then straight into all sorts of involvements with managing transport, both in his own right, in the private sector, uh, particularly with capital.
from Sydney bus, which led him into First Group, which had led him into TfL as Managing Director of the Surface Transport. Uh, and I need to say no more than that, because uh, that journey is effectively the subject of his talk. So without any further ado from me, a great welcome to Leon Benjamin. Goodness, everybody I know is here. <laughs> Unbelievable, Paul, Nick, Roger, Mike, Bruce. My oh, goodness, dear, oh dear. Right, well, this is going to be quite hard, especially if you've been to the Omnibus Society Presidential Address, because you've seen it already. Um, <laughs> only that last time it wasn't streamed, uh, like this is being streamed uh, internationally, globally. Uh, so wherever you are now is where you'll be on the internet. And I guess also just to say this is probably the first time I've done this talk uh, since I announced I was leaving, uh, indeed retiring, and you might well ask why am I leaving, and there's quick questions and answers at the end, so you can ask if you like, <laughs> um, I'll try and tell you, depending on how we've got um, on the way through. So great to be here, thank you very much indeed, here in the Cubic Theatre at the uh, museum, uh, and it's all quite amazing for me because I continue to think of myself as the youngest person in the group of people that I knew in my interest in uh, buses. Uh, and I was just a young lad and uh, met all these other amazing people. Uh, some of you are here, uh, much older now. Uh, and, and, and here I am on the cusp of retiring. It's actually quite hard to be the person that's the youngest of the generation about to retire. <coughs> that means everybody else is older than you are, which is a bit frightening. So, uh, the purpose of tonight's talk really was just to have a canter through some things. So there's no great structure to this. These are just some photographs about things that have happened um, in the past that I thought you might be interested in. So there's no structure. There's also uh, no script. Uh, therefore, if you've seen this before, you might get a different script. And if you're watching this uh, on the internet, then I look forward to seeing it repeated badly on Twitter. So I, I, I thought I'd start off with how it started. So here I am, age four, with my, with my conductor's outfit outside my house. Um, and I couldn't possibly have imagined when I was four with my conductor's outfit that I might end up in charge of transport in this city. Um, and I, I think my mother still has the conductor's machine. Um, and uh, I never possibly thought that this might lead to something interesting. But I do remember when I was about five, um, going up to London with my dad um, on a Red Rover, which was five shillings, two and six for me in those days. Um, and I can remember the feeling I got when we got into central London. There's this amazing magic about it, which I remember thinking about. I remember thinking to myself, I really want to live here. And I really want to work here. And I really wouldn't mind something about this transport. It was just, I can remember at five, I can remember being on the front seat of a 73 with sausage rolls, which my mum had packed, um, and thinking, this is just incredible, and I really want to be part of it. Um, and so I could never have imagined that I would be stood, for example, here today, talking to you about that. Never could I possibly imagined meeting the Queen, meeting the Prime Minister, going to see the Secretary of State, all sorts of really important things that were just, for me, things that I read about in the newspaper or seen on the television and finally got one. And uh, it is just very humbling and very um, odd to be stood here getting a great introduction from Barry and from and appreciation from you uh, and, and looking back and realise that I've ended up doing rather more things and meeting more people and been involved in more things than I could ever, ever have imagined. So I feel very, I feel very humble about that. Anyway, um, some sort of little anecdotes that just take us through, otherwise we'll be here all night, and um, that will save you buying my memoirs, um, <laughs> which, which come in two volumes. There's the big, thick book um, that, will, that will fill in some of the spaces inside Roger's uh, brilliant book uh, about, uh, about, about a certain period in our lives. And the second volume is a set of finely crafted freedom of information requests that you just tear out, sign and send in, and get all the people inside TfL and the Greater London Authority um, uh, excited for, um, for, for the future, for sure. Not really, if you're watching this at home, that's not what I'm doing, it's just a joke. So, so let's do the Cobham Bus Museum period. Uh, this is exciting. These two pictures both have a fabulous story. Bruce, who is in the audience, knows both of these stories, so you can go. 
Um, that's RT1320, a Green Saunders RT. If you know your history, there were no Green Saunders RTs. That was a straightforward Alan Orby bit of fun. And Bruce and I, who took our PSV test on the same day, uh, had been trained on RT1320. We had done everything with our wonderful instructor, John Killick, um, who was from the old school of Chiswick driving instructors, um, who knew nothing except to beat you into complete submission and rebuild you in his own image. Just remember, he would say, everybody else on the road is a complete uh, <laughs> apart from you. I'm not even sure about that, he would say. So we would... <laughs> anyway, just about the week before the test, Bruce, you remember this, about the week before the test, Alan Orme at Common Bus Museum decided he really ought to check on the paperwork for RT1320, since we were going for tests at Balls Pond Road, and that's when we found we hadn't had an MOT for a year. Uh, took it down to Guildford Testing Station, where it promptly failed, because it had broken spring. And Bruce and I ended up taking our test on a bus we'd never driven before, another RT, but a bus we'd never been, um, we'd never, we'd never, uh, never driven before, uh, which was the way in which it was run. And I mention that story because in those days there was a sort of fun, you know, thinking about it now, we would be horrified to be driving a vehicle that wasn't taxed or tested. Um, we would be horrified to be doing things in the sort of shortcut way. And it was of the time. So sort of bus preservation, you could do that sort of thing then in a way that you can't, you can't do now. So Bruce knows the other story. That's RF332 converted at Cobham as a tow bus. And this is Bruce and I on our way up to Woomerall Diesels in the snow. And Bruce remembers the night. Uh, it was you and me, Alan. And inside RF332, Alan had installed a freestanding paraffin heater. <laughs> so we're about to tram up the motorway with this freestanding paraffin heater, okay? Like, you know, one little bump and the thing is going to go up in complete flames. And most of the seats were removed and we slept in sleeping bags, Bruce, you remember this, and scattered on the floor of the bus were odd bus batteries all over the place. And I can remember Alan Orby to this day, Bruce remembers this, he looked across at me as I got myself in my sleeping bag and said, do you know, if the zip on your sleeping bag touches those terminals in the right order, very briefly, you're going to be the warmest you've ever been, followed by, <laughs> followed by the coldest you've ever been permanently. And, and, um, and uh, again, just looking back, we would never dream now of doing that, would we? You know, paraffin stove on the M1, uh, bus with those seats, sleeping on the floor, and that's a load of old batteries. I mean, we just, we just never dreamed of doing it. And then, as you know, I spent some time working for Prince Marshall at um, Obsolete Fleet, which was an exciting period in my uh, career, because that's where I learned a load of stuff that um, previously somehow had escaped me. Because Prince got into the <coughs> transport business almost by accident. You will know that he ran Old Motor Magazine, and he was a great vintage vehicle enthusiast. Uh, and he was using pretty well all the money that the magazine made to try and um, uh, restore his old vehicles. Uh, and he'd been to America, and he came back from America and saw how vintage vehicle restoration is done in the US, which is not to bugger about on a Sunday with some sandpaper and a paintbrush trying to make up for the ravages of the previous week, but is actually about raising some serious money, doing a professional uh, restoration as quickly as possible, and then having the vehicle to use. So. Uh, that's how ST922 uh, got restored, um, uh, as the old motor sales team was sent out looking for sponsorship. Uh, somebody, not me, somebody came back with uh, Johnny Walker, parted with £20,000 for the restoration of ST922. I'm not sure they would have parted with it if they'd known that ST922 was broadly a bit of a chassis and some bits of body. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the money was used to restore it, and it went into service um, on Route uh, 100 um, in London, as you know. The operation of Route 100, another one of those fabulous examples where people like Prince Marshall, only people like him could succeed. Because Prince used to live in Down Street, which is just turning off Piccadilly, and in those days the London Transport Chairman had a chairman's flat uh, near Green Park. Prince and the London Transport Chairman at the time used to walk their dogs in Green Park together. And it's as a result of talking on their dog walking expedition that the idea of running a vintage bus in London uh, was first born. So it didn't happen as a result of a series of meetings, it wasn't the result of shared objectives, it was dog walking in Green Park that brought us uh, ST922 into service in London, originally uh, using um, London Transport crews uh, and in later uh, using obsolete fleet crews. 
As a result of doing that, this is a period of very serious London transport staff shortage, and so uh, Obsolete Fleet was contracted to do more and more stuff that the uh, mainstream organisation couldn't do, including open-top sightseeing buses, including 74Z, Baker Street to the zoo, in fact, pretty well anything that, um, pretty well anything that uh, main, wasn't mainstream bus services was started to be pushed our way. Um, and it would be fair to say now that we were overwhelmed with the amount of work that we had to do. We really weren't resourced um, uh, to do it because obviously Fleet was a private company um, and um, we didn't have a huge amount of money and it was a very, very um, uh, difficult period to manage uh, the expansion. But of course it was the period where we learnt, we learnt so much. And we did all sorts of things. So the picture on the left is our private training bus. The picture on the right is much more interesting. That's the Friday evening before the wedding of Charles and Diana. So we had this great idea that to see the fireworks in Hyde Park, if we just took one open topper and parked it in Tyburn Way, nobody would ever dare move us. So we did. Uh, and here we are in Tyburn Way on this, um, on this picture. Um, and th this picture is very early on. As time progressed, the whole area became completely log jammed with, um, with buses. Uh, that was our sort of entrepreneurial spirit because uh, Simon Kay, who was active in the preservation um, uh, department, was with us, one of our guests, and a real bus on the 159 uh, uh, not only got stuck in the traffic, it got stuck completely. So Simon crawled underneath with LM6's <laughs> broom and hit the starter ring gear, um, and we sent Trisic an invoice that says, diagnosed gentleman starter, <laughs> speed off, 150 pounds. And the invoice came back with a little compliment slip on it and said, I don't call hitting it with a broom. <laughs> 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 Nevertheless, they did pay it, and um, that's, how we, that's how we made our, made our money. Uh, and then we had lots of sightseeing activity. Uh, so, Roger, you're here. And um, uh, sightseeing, uh, our sightseeing, all of our sightseeing exploits took advantage of an amazingly good defect in the 1980 Transport Act, which is for uh, sightseeing services like these. Um, the traffic commissioner was obliged to grant the license. The drafting of it was very sloppy. It opened the door to anybody and anybody who wanted to run sightseeing tours in London could, uh, could do so. And by golly, we did. Um, Eros Island, uh, which in those days was an island, uh, was awash with converted DMSs from uh, all sorts of companies like um, Ebden's and City Rama uh, and so on. <coughs> and it was a period when a considerable amount of tourist money was available. And it took advantage of the fact that London Transport had so badly dealt with the sightseeing market. There was a uh, wonderful inspector at Piccadilly Circus, London Transport sightseeing point, who would tell the garage not to send open toppers to Piccadilly Circus because too many people queued to get on it. <laughs> Only, and so of course, you know, we did the opposite. We put all of those uh, in as quickly as we could. Uh, so I had London Pride sightseeing, uh, and in this picture, um, you must spot Peter Newman and Ross uh, dressed as Father Christmas for our Christmas uh, light service in Coventry Street. Um, and uh, I expect when Peter comes to talk to you at Christmas, he'll have a picture of me in the Father Christmas. <laughs> um, so London Pride sightseeing, we uh, uh, joined that party. Um, uh, I had found this amazing pickup point in Coventry Street outside what was to become the Trocadero. Uh, that bit of Coventry Street, the most heavily trafficked. Uh, pavements uh, anywhere in the West End, especially in the evening. That was an absolute magnet for sightseeing passengers. The very last sightseeing trip we ever ran was at 0040. And the only reason why we had to stop running at 0040 is we really did have to get the drivers back on a Saturday night um, in order to have them back on Sunday morning. So it was uh, uh, extraordinary. And sightseeing buses still run from there. It's not quite such a busy place as it was. And we also, as you can see from the um, bottom left, uh, bought Culture Bus which had a chequered uh, ownership. And the takeover of Culture Bus, which we bought from the uh, receivers, uh, was extraordinary. Because the night that Culture Bus sold to us, all the drivers took all the buses to a pub somewhere in South London. Um, and we had to go and fetch them. <laughs> <laughs> so just imagine for a moment, just, just think, this is a pub full of drivers who have just all been given the sack. They've stolen their buses and brought them all down to this park. <laughs> and we are going to go and try and seize the assets that we just paid for. Now, pretty well all those vehicles were uh, DMSs, but you might remember they had one Metropolitan double-decker, one Metroscania double-decker. 
so when we sneaked up to the sound of singing in this pub, I thought I was being clever by taking the Metropolitan. So we all piled in the buses, started up, because as soon as we started, the sound of the engine started up, you know, got the culture bus drivers all to, um, you know, look, they're stealing our buses, look, let's go to them and so on. So this lynching mob <laughs> starts to come out of the pub and head towards us. All my colleagues in the DMSs uh, have started, I've got to Metropolitan, which has got this amazing air system thing, because it's got air suspension and all the rest of it. So without any air, you have no throttle. So the doors are open, I've got my foot all the way on the ground, but it's just still ticking over. It's going to take now some considerable time for enough air to be built up for the suspension, never mind the doors, never mind the gear. And this lynching party, now I see all of my colleagues with DMS is disappearing in a cloud of <laughs> exhaust smoke. And there's only me. You know, the last one goes. And the lynching mob has got to about the middle doors. I mean, it just about got to the middle doors. Uh, last moment, finally, the suspension pumped itself up. The door slammed shut. And because I had it in gear, it just took off. <laughs> which, was, which, was, which was magic. And um, so that's how we retrieved all of our buses. The following day, we ran a full service on Culture Bus. Um, and, um, and the rest, as they say, is history. So, um, not surprisingly, inside Ensign Bus, uh, now as the first dose of 1985 bus route contracts have become up for grabs. Of course, we're in their bidding. And as anybody who was in there in the first round is concerned, uh, the prices were wonderful. Uh, and uh, we were very happy with it. So we had a fleet of buses of all sorts uh, in, our, uh, in, our, in our operation. And uh, we started with 145 in June 86, uh, later 62. Uh, after that, some services in the Longford Hornchurch area. But the bottom picture is the interesting one here, because that is the old Aldenham tilt test machine, which when we were at Ensign Bus, um, um, we bought, when Aldenham was closed, we bought the tilt test machine, and it's here in situ at uh, Perfleet. When I say we bought it, that rather assumes that the person we gave the money to was the owner of the property <laughs> and authorised to sell it. <laughs> because no sooner had we got our tilt test machine cemented into the ground at Perfleet, and as you can see here, uh, using, using it, that's a Rolls-Royce powered South Yorkshire uh, uh, Metrobus, we were, the police arrived in large numbers uh, and <laughs> accused us of stealing it. Um, this thing has to be seriously concreted into the ground. You couldn't steal it from Aldenham without a lot of fuss. You certainly couldn't take it out of the works without all the fuss, and you certainly couldn't hide it here. <laughs> so it was long protracted. It eventually ended up with our engineering director being arrested. Uh, I remember going to Baker Street, PTP um, uh, place, where, where the Met were, 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 were interviewing her under caution for stealing the test machine. So, uh, and it took months to unravel. Uh, unravel we did. At one point, the police said they wanted to take it into protective custody. <laughs> <laughs> and so look, it's cemented into the ground. It really isn't going to go anywhere. So, uh, so we had lots of different uh, vehicles. As you can see, we eventually started to buy some new vehicles. Um, and you can see in there the first of our wonderful fleet of 24 Dennis Dominators with Northern Counties bodies, which were absolutely gorgeous. Uh, we bought Dominators because we have fleet lines, so we liked 6 LXB Gunner engines. Um, so the Dominator was a natural uh, successor to the... Um, to the fleet line, um, uh, and also we had metro buses uh, again with Gardner engines because um, because it went so well. So we were so, and again this fleet expanded very quickly. We learned a lot of things that we didn't know. Uh, we delivered some really good quality services, and it brought competition into the marketplace uh, and so on, as we as we know. And then, in about oh, in exactly 1990, um, Peter and I decided that we would sell off the bus operating business. Um, leaving Ensign Bus concentrated with sightseeing and just floating off the um, contracted bus business. Uh, I was agreed I would go with the contracted bus business because they thought they might get a slightly higher price if the person running it went with it. Uh, so we, uh, so we, uh, we sold it off. We had several attempts at selling it off, but we finally sold it off to the Chinese. Uh, in fact, we sold it off to the CMT Group, Hong Kong Chinese businessmen, which also owns City Bus in Hong Kong. Also owned China Paint, China Harbour View Hotel, Really Fusion in Hong Kong, uh, and others. And there's a rather interesting picture of me on the front page of the business section of the Sunday Times magazine, um, uh, explaining about how this, um, about this, why the Chinese had 
forced him to discuss business. So the real reason why the Chinese brought in is quite different to the reason that was given at the time. The reason at the time was about overseas investment and, um, and so on. But the real reason, which is now easily a matter of public record, um, is that uh, our chairman, T.T. Choi, had been commissioned by the Chinese government to repair relationships with the West after Tiananmen Square. And so this had a, uh, the TT was one of a number of business people sent out into the West. So the buying of um, the uh, bus business in Dagenham Dock, alongside Rolls-Royce engines for Cathay Pacific 747s, along with the TT Choi Gallery of Chinese Art at the Victoria and Albert Museum for two and a half million pounds, were all examples of the Chinese government repairing relationships with UK and the, the West um, in this uh, period after Tiananmen Square in the late 80s. Um, I can't think of any bus company that's ever been involved in a purchase in order to promote Sino-British relationships. That's, it's really strange. And this was just a small cog in a very big uh, diplomatic um, machine. <coughs> T.T. Choi's had a huge collection of Chinese art, uh, Anne Heseltine was a patron of his Museum of Chinese Iniquities uh, uh, and chi 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 iniquities. <laughs> <laughs> Chinese Antiques. Um, um, and there would be these wonderful meetings in Hong Kong with members of the British government. And a piece of history that if you dig into your mind very carefully is you may remember that uh, John Major was the first Western leader to visit China after Tiananmen Square. And that came about ex entirely as a result of a meeting that we all had um, uh, with members of the UK government uh, at the time. Uh, and so that whole thing was uh, uh, beautifully uh, orchestrated uh, Chinese diplomacy. Uh, T.T. Choi, who's dead now, um, was, uh, was part of that. I think it's really fascinating to have been on the inside of a piece of diplomatic history, which had nothing to do with buses at all. It was to do with, um, it was to do with relations. So when we were in the Chinese, um, we had lots of money, uh, and um, he had all sorts of interests. So there's a few of these things in here which I especially love. Um, I especially love the fact that we brought articulated buses to London decades before Ken Livingston and others. I said decades, years before Ken Livingston um, and others did. Here we are with our ex-British Airways Leyland DAB articulated um, vehicle geared up, ready to be on the 507. How far-sighted were we? 1992, we've got our tickets for the 507. Uh, that particular picture is interesting. It's at North Weald. Uh, it was the first appearance of that vehicle, and we were beating at the time for 507 and um, <clears throat> what's now 521. And I can remember being called into Clive Hodson's office the Monday morning, and he threw that picture at me and said, what's all this? And I said, uh, this is the... This is our plan for the 507 and 521. Our tender bids, which we're going to submit, will be based on these Leyland DAB Arctics, because we think Arctics are the right thing for Red Arrow Services. And he said, well, I'm going to sue you for breaching our copyright. That's got our name, our Red Arrow logo. That's our copyright, and I'm going to sue you for a breach of copyright. So I said, uh, well, Clive, I'm actually at the North Wheel Bus Rally. Are you going to sue everybody at the Northfield Bus Rally over the breach of your co copyright? Because everything there has got London Transport on it. Everything has got the round on it. Everything has got Green Line. has got your fleet name. Everything. Get out! Just come in. Get out! <laughs> so, so having been summoned into Clive's office, I was then properly thrown out again. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and although that particular project we didn't win, um, uh, it did set a bit of a scene for articulated buses on Red Arrow services. So we are proud to have been part of that. Um, I'm going to move on a little bit quickly because I know you've all got better things to do. Um, when the roving diplomatic initiative was over, the Chinese um, didn't need us anymore. So I was very lucky that my management team and I bought the company, uh, and then about three years later we sold it on to the first group. And here's Trevor Smallwood and Moy Lockhead, um, and our first iterations of what was Capital City Bus in the ownership of uh, first group. July 1998. I will never forget the day. In fact, I'll never forget the week. And you're all going to say, yeah, I bet that's because they paid you a load of money. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what was really bad. Um, 
When we set up Capital City Bus as a management buyout, title to the company was contained in a single bearer share, which was kept in the safe of the lawyers. So as we get into the final stage of the negotiation with the first group, and you know it's a little bit, it's all a bit nervy because. You know, after weeks and weeks and weeks of negotiation, the deal isn't a deal until you've signed, and they could walk away at any time, something else could happen, they get a better offer, something could go wrong with us, we could have an accident or something. So, literally, we're in the last week, and our solicitors called us uh, over, uh, as they often did, and they sat us down and said, we need to talk to you about the single bearer share that confirms your title to Capital City Bus, which is essential just to have to give to first group. We've lost it. <laughs> what do you mean you've lost it? We can't find it. It's not in the file where it should be. I said, okay, well, okay. that's wrong. <laughs> Make another one. That's, well, it's not quite as easy as that. It's a legal share. And if we made another one, and the original turned up, then we'd have two original bearer shares, and you'd have a contest about who's the ownership was. So, so I don't it's not like a pound note, you know, if I give you a pound note, well, it's yours, but, you know, if these goods are really mine and you happen to be holding the certificate, that doesn't make it yours, does it? It's, well, it is a bearer share, so if you're not holding it, <coughs> it's not yours. Oh, prompt. I said, well, the first thing we can't do is tell first group about this. For God's sake, don't tell first group. They'll just run away. So we came out, so the lawyer said, look, I said, well, we'll, we'll we we'll just need to think about this, and maybe we'll have another meeting tomorrow. Oh no, said the lawyers, we can't see you anymore. Since we've been negligent, you've almost certainly got a case against us. So you will now need to go and find another law firm to look after your affairs, and almost certainly sue us, and probably bring one of the biggest legal negligence claims in the history of London. So we, so we ended up outside the offices, stood looking at each other, thinking, what do we do now? You know? So our lawyers have just thrown us out. Um, we can't find a bearer share to our um, um, company. And they told us to go and find another law firm, but we just stood in the street without briefcases wondering you know, what to do next. So the good news is that, as you might have guessed from your history, because first we did buy the company, um, the bearer share was found. Uh, and a, an army of, and I'm not going to use the, list, the solicitor's name because it's, it's, it's a long time ago now, and it wouldn't be fair in case you use them. Uh, but uh, they had a huge search across the weekend. They brought in hundreds of people, went through thousands of files, and eventually found our bearer share in the wrong file. And I won't forget the call. I do remember I was just sat in the car feeling miserable. I felt so miserable, I'd done the only thing I knew what to do in those days to alleviate how upset I was. I was PC world. And, you know, in those days, you could walk around PC world and think, oh, I really wish I had a one of those. And, um, and the phone call came, said, we found your bearer share, get over here quickly, deal is on, and so on. So we did, and there we are. So I ended up in first group. Um, now, the, interesting, not many people who sell their businesses to one of the big PLCs stay there for very long, and that's because most people can't bear to see what the new owner does with their old company. And hardly anybody did that. Actually, I stayed there 13 years, uh, which says something about somebody, uh, not sure which. The, Oh, I had some fabulous times at First Group. So here's some of the fabulous times. Here we are with our FTR uh, in York. Uh, here we are putting double deck size adverts on single deck uh, vehicles in York. Uh, here we are with um, more FTR. And here we are with Greyhound. Um, and the reason I stayed 13 years in First Group is because they found lots of interesting things for me to do. In fact, I was not responsible for London at all after uh, 2004, 2005. And I was between America and Europe and, um, and, and UK. And I got to do all sorts of interesting things. Bringing Greyhound to UK was an interesting experience um, because First Group had bought Greyhound as part of buying Blade Law. Uh, and uh, there was a real idea that we could compete with National Express. Is that right, John? And uh, a strange conversation. We had did, 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 did. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, it, didn't really, it didn't really take off. But there were lots of other interesting things to do. Uh, this is amongst my favourites. So we'll start with the yellow school bus, which was another plan to bring the American yellow school bus uh, to the UK. Cheap school travel was Roy Lockhead's idea. And uh, here we are with our first right-hand drive bluebird. Everything about this project went wrong. Okay. So in America, 
<laughs> there are tens of thousands of school buses, and they're very cheap. They're built with a very high floor, with the American requirement to be able to withstand being broadsided by a heavy truck and protect the children. Um, and in America, basically, school travel is in your taxes, so therefore your children are picked up from near home, taken to school. And the school times in America are all staggered. So uh, some of these vehicles do two or three return runs a day because the eldest ones go very early, the younger ones go later, and the youngest ones go later. So you get two or three return trips out of it. Um, in the UK, none of that's true. What the market's after is low floor, not high floor. Uh, uh, free travel to school is not in your taxes uh, in this country in the way it is in America, so the parents had to pay for this. Uh, it was considered to be some dreadful American uh, import, and we managed to place about 20 or 30 of these, but nothing like the thousands uh, that I think Moy had envisaged that um, we would do to transform school travel. Um, because frankly, the American model was very cheap and very cheerful, um, and, and over here it was neither. It was also, I have to say, um, not cheap, because, uh, because of the way in which the tariffs between the UK and US work. By the time you paid all the duty, paid the taxes, uh, got the things here, uh, they, were, they were very expensive, and uh, nothing about it really worked. Um, bottom, uh, I'm in Dubai, uh, where there was a contract going, and the reason for this picture is that for as far as you can see, there are lines and lines of new coaches, because one of the things that happens in Dubai is they buy very large numbers of vehicles with no work, and leave them parked in the desert for a very long time. So uh, I had to have my picture taken with an infinite number of Volvo coaches, which were just sat there cooking um, day after day. And then finally, uh, top left, um, which is Las Vegas. Uh, I'm sorry about the coincidence with today's tragic news, but um, to the north of Las Vegas, that's waiting for a civis with optical guidance. Um, and you can see the dotted line on the road. Uh, and the civis with op optical guidance is sort of like a rubber tire tram idea, uh, where you get very accurate docking of the vehicle um, at a high quality stop. <coughs> Las Vegas is a really stupid place to do optical guidance for a couple of reasons. The bus has to accurately track the white lines in the road. In Las Vegas, it gets very hot, and the tarmac does this, so your nice straight white lines become all wavy. When an optically guided bus tries to follow a wavy white line, <laughs> instead of pulling up at a stop nice and straight, it wobbles about all over the place and makes people think. That would be if there was a white line to follow, because the only thing that happens in the desert is there's a lot of sand, and if your wobbly white line is covered with sand, the optical guidance can't pick it up at all. So, so of all the places to recommend optical guidance, uh, Las Vegas in the desert is definitely not one of them. The other great thing that was um, of the time was um, I got to look after first group in Germany in a wonderful town called Speyer, uh, and Speyer has the most wonderful uh, engineering vehicle technical uh, museum. Uh, and I can see from the nods that some of you have seen it, and it's sister one at uh, Sintheim, which is just up the road, which has a number of interesting things <coughs> in it, never mind the bus. The only surviving Russian space shuttle, Buran, because the, uh, the, the only other one, the Russian one, uh, was destroyed uh, when the building collapsed on it. Uh, so the only surviving Russian space shuttle is in this museum uh, in Germany. It's also the only place where you can see the Tupelo Tu-144 and Concorde side by side. Uh, so, as a museum, I seriously recommend that you go. If you like big, heavy engineering and you like transport, full-size railway locomotives, uh, aviation, and all that other stuff, um, it's really, uh, really worth the trip. And one of the reasons I love looking after First Group in Germany is I could go there, uh, and um, I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. Uh, some other things in First Group uh, of interest, uh, and the top picture is uh, uh, the opening of the new Aberdeen depot and some vintage vehicles in place. But the green line I wanted to talk about, um, because there's a case of where Moyer Lockhead was absolutely right. So as you know, the Windsor Green Line is just about the last recognizable bit of the Green Line network since, um, since 1930. Um, and although there are other bits of Green Line, they're not uh, date from quite the same period. And during the period while I was looking after it, um, we had got a point where we thought it would have to come off because uh, the economics were terrible, the vehicles were getting older, um, the ridership was falling because we were in competition with rail, the journey times were getting protracted, and, um, and I remember Moy and I went out one morning, and we were just talking, and I said, you know, I think I'm gonna have to take off the Windsor Green Line, 
and that really hurts me because that's what I remember from my youth and I really don't want to be the person that finally puts the knife in the old Green Line network. And so Moyer said, as he did brilliantly, look, if you take it off, somebody else will try something else and you'll give it up forever. Why don't you go back and think about what else you could do? Just pretend you're our competitor. What would a competitor do to take this market? And so a wonderful guy who worked for me, Matthew Wall, who's now at uh, Wickett Coaches for Transit, um, came up with this wonderful idea called Rainbow Fairs. And the idea of Rainbow Fairs was that every journey on the Windsor Green Line was a different price. Because the Windsor Green Line has some interesting characteristics. Commuters into London in the morning, tourists out to Windsor in the morning, then some fiddling about during the middle of the day, and then the opposite in the evening, tourists um, out back to London, commuters back to Windsor. So Matthew came up with this great idea, of why didn't we charge a different fare for every journey? So on the busy, busy journeys, which people had to take, like tourists, the price would be quite high, and on other journeys, it would be quite low, cheaper to pound. In fact, so, so Rainbow came out of the fact that the destination lines and the timetable and so on uh, were all colour-coded so you knew what the price was. <coughs> it was such a success, it had to be converted to double-deck, which is still the case now. It performs very strongly, uh, various improvements have been made to it over time. We restored it to Slough, which had been taken away from, um, and Moy was entirely right. It's an interesting business concept. If you think you're going to take something off because it's not working, just think about what your competitor would do, and instead of letting him do it, why don't you do it uh, for our benefit? And that was, um, that was a, tremendous, um, <coughs> a tremendous success for us. So I've also done some things in bus preservation, and with Paul here, John Marshall here, Nick, uh, and others, um, you'll be delighted to see our RTW 467, which was rescued for preservation in 1967 and has been continuously in preservation uh, ever since, which is a great testimony to uh, the, those, those of the time, uh, most of whom are still with us, which is wonderful. Um, and we continue to keep it class six tested, it continues to uh, be able to operate in service, and um, uh, still get a great thrill from uh, being able to keep the RTW uh, going. Bearing in mind that they've been gone since 1966, so to be able to run um, RTWs anywhere, I think, is, uh, is magic. And be, to be able to have it um, in service in London, I think, is, is, is great. I've got some other projects. Um, so this is MBA 444, um, as discovered at Bedfordshire um, Education Authority, uh, and also when new, now, <coughs> now looks like that. Got some transfers and things on it now. It's amazing the reaction you get. Uh, really exciting. When we did um, the anniversary, the 50th anniversary of Red Arrows, um, uh, so back in the 60s, we're talking 1960s, um, one fair, a lot of people standing. Um, hang on, that's what we do now. You know? <laughs> Everything is one fair. All of our buses carry a significant number of um, standing passengers. Um, I, I think it's important to remember the hardware of the 60s might have been useless, but the concepts of London transport in the 60s about shorter routes, about carrying more standing passengers, about a single fare, and so on, was just way ahead of its time. The hardware let it down, hardware wasn't ready, but actually now the whole network is that, one fare and so on. So I think that's just a tremendous uh, testament to, um, to the far-sightedness, uh, almost to the point of um, <coughs> ridiculous because um, you wouldn't really want to run a bus with turnstiles and a change machine if you could possibly avoid it um, but uh, it, it after a lot of uh, difficulties and heartache um, it became a recipe uh, for the network so since uh, John Self and Nick Agnew are here I have to have a picture of our RM613 don't I boys so um, uh, and uh, one of our other co-owners is not here tonight uh, and here's 613 uh, at London Bus and Truck Roger um, and and um, so famous is it that the entire Olympics transport team <coughs> travelled with it um, at one of our pre-Olympics uh, events over here at uh, Greenwich. Um, and uh, uh, Nick and John and Keith and I are really proud that 613 is in the picture with everybody who's responsible for transport um, in the Olympics. 
So in retirement, of course, I've got one or two projects to do. So I better do this one, because you've all been asking for it for so long. My Dartford Tunnel Cycle Bus, which I have to tell you isn't like this now. This is when it is new. The newness has worn off it a bit, 1963. Um, but it is the project to do whilst I'm still uh, around. Um, and so we've got to do some work on it. For those of you who don't possibly remember, um, when the Dartford um, Perfleet Tunnel opened uh, in 1963, cyclists weren't allowed. So uh, in pure extravagance, five of these double-deckers uh, were built in order to carry 23 cyclists and 33 passengers. Uh, the reason why there were more seats than cycles is to make the allowance for tandems. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and what a great bus, eh? Fancy having a bus. Fancy going to the testing station now with a bus where you walk down the stairs and emerge from a hole six feet up off the ground. <laughs> without the doors. Um, and, uh, so the restoration of that will be tremendous. The great thing about it is when we bring it back, nobody will remember it. And everybody will say, I remember those. No, they don't. Because unless, you were, unless, unless you were a cyclist in the, in the, in the Dartford Perfect area for a few months in 1963, you never saw one at all. So... There we go. Uh, the other thing, Roger, I think we fit it with blind boxes and swear they always have them. <laughs> um, so that, that's what we've got to do. So look, we better do the commercial for the organisation, otherwise they'll think this is just one long um, run through uh, nostalgia, which it is for me, but there we are. So uh, let's talk about the organisation we're currently running. The numbers are still staggering. 2.3 billion passengers a year, 6.5 million bus passengers. More than 50% of the bus journeys in England are made in London. Uh, bus fleet has been fully accessible for years, thanks to the work of Andrew uh, and others. Um, we've got a high level of wheelchair uh, accessibility at uh, bus stops. Uh, there's still 24,000 on drivers, and now uh, heading on for 2,500 hybrid um, vehicles in the fleet. Some people will be telling you some stories about this dramatic fall in bus ridership. Have you been reading about this? You know? Since I took over, bus ridership has <laughs> ended its 16 year growth. And it's, it's not quite like that. Um, there are some changes, but the changes are social, what's happening. So we've, been on, we've had 16 years of solid growth of bus, um, of bus ridership, but actually there's been some other priorities, like walking and cycling. Um, and uh, mayor, uh, mayors, various, have made it clear that walking and cycling is very important. The loss of bus ridership to walking and cycling is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. So provided we're satisfied that these bus passengers have moved to walking and cycling and haven't got in their cars, then actually this is, um, this, is to be, this is to be welcomed. There's still going to be a big bus service requirement in uh, London, but a whole series of things have caused bus ridership to change. For as long as I can remember, bus ridership tracked population, which is still going, and it tracked reliability. So we use excess wait time as a principal measure of reliability. <coughs> excess wait time, if you want the long explanation, it's on the internet, but the short explanation is, when you arrive at a bus stop randomly, which is what you do, you will wait on average half the frequency. So we measure the difference between half the frequency and the actual frequency, and that's our excess waiting time measure. So buses every 10 minutes, on average you'll wait five. Because sometimes you get there and you just miss one and wait nine, sometimes you get there and there's one, June there's one, but on average, Random arrival at bus stops, we wait five minutes. Um, so we measure the difference, that's our excess waiting time. It's currently 1.1 minutes. So uh, if you expect to wait five, you wait 6.1. The best it's ever been. But ridership is no longer tracking reliability, and it's no longer tracking population quite so much. Because people don't arrive at bus stops randomly because they have these. Mm -hmm. And they look up the time of the bus, and they do one of a number of things. They walk. The next bus is in nine minutes, and they can walk to the station in eight. They walk. Um, or they go to the pub. Or they go and do something else. So real-time information in the hands of the public has allowed them to make more informed choices. And some of those more informed choices are about not taking the bus. Let's also remind ourselves that bus ridership is not a sort of virility proposition. <coughs> this isn't about how can we carry the most number of people year on year. It's not like we're selling washing machines, where you do want to sell more washing machines and more washing machines. Bus ridership is only there for people who need to go somewhere. So if they don't want to go there, uh, they don't need to go there. If they're doing their shopping on Amazon, if they don't need to go there, it's not our job to persuade them. Our job is to carry the people who want to travel. And if society changes, 
that fewer people need to travel, then our network just has to just has to follow that. Um, so in terms of bus ridership, um, uh, uh, it's leveled out actually. We've had 18 months or so of year on year, a couple of percent, leveled out again now. But that's a pretty deep average. Um, the growth is in the suburbs, strong growth is in the suburbs, uh, in the very centre where there's many more opportunities, including on the underground. Uh, so to take a case in point, um, you know, the Finchley Road was grossly overbussed because the Jubilee Line is now every 34 trains an hour. So why would you, on the Jubilee Line, which follows Finchley Road for so much of it, many more people were on the Jubilee Line than, than on the bus service. So we have, we have to think now. Um, air quality. Uh, this is big. Um, so we're on a campaign to get everything to Euro 6 or better by 2020. I don't just mean in the low emission zone. I don't just mean inside the north and south circular road. I mean every bus in London is Euro 6 or better by 2020. That's phenomenal. That's 5,000 retrofits of Euro 4 and Euro, Euro, Euro 5 vehicles. But you can do the maths. This is, this is October 2017. This has got to be done by 2020. Um, there's not 5,000 days between now and then. So that tells you just how many retrofits have to be done every day. It's a big, big job. <coughs> on retrofits um, and uh, we are really working really very hard in order to do that. And we've also got some zero emission stuff, which you know, but here are the numbers anyway. Um, the way forward is zero emission. So this hybrid business <coughs> that we're working towards, this Euro 6 retrofit thing that we're working, is just a stepping stone to zero emission. Um, and London is leading the way internationally. We've got more electric buses than anybody else in Europe. Uh, hybrid itself uh, is only a limited technology. The real future is zero emission. Uh, and that's why we now have our uh, various fleets of full electric buses, including everything on the 507 and 521, including now all the single deck routes that come into zone one uh, will be, by 2018, um, uh, fully zero emission. I'm saying zero emission. You might be hearing electric. I'm saying zero emission. Hydrogen is also zero emission. So uh, we're, not, um, we're not saying electric. We're saying zero emission. In terms of the technologies, um, electric is developing faster, um, but has some range limitations. Hydrogen is capable of much longer range, but there's some complications with that, uh, which we can go into if you really would like to. Um, but this, here's the... Here's the, here's the Lineup of um, of the fleet that we've got and what we're going, what we're heading towards, uh, and I think um, London is very much leading the way. The complication with all this stuff is that there's no point in just getting rid of emissions in London if you're causing them somewhere else. And there's all sorts of conversations to be had about renewable energy. So only 30% of the UK's energy is renewable. So if you you might have zero emission buses, but how much CO2 is created um, in along the way? So there's, so there's lots of debate about it. Nevertheless, the place where air quality is at its worst is in the centre of London. Some streets in London breach their annual limit for uh, particulates by the third week of January. And it's silence, this stuff. You're breathing it in all the time. And it's impairing your brain, it's impairing your health, it's affecting your children and so on. The mayor is an adult asthma sufferer. So we are on a determined mission to get to zero emission um, early 2040s, um, and that will involve us going full out to get to Euro 6 um, by 2020, and then a further rolling program um, to zero emission. Uh, in there's hydrogen. We've got eight, two more to come. Um, hydrogen, uh, it's promising, but it's been promising for a long time. We had the first hydrogen vehicles in London in 2004. Uh, it's now 2017. Uh, still issues about um, uh, the storage and uh, the range, but absolutely getting better. And it's good to have a competitive market, hydrogen versus electricity. It's good to have the two um, um, working uh, against each other in competition. So we will be letting contracts for two central London double-decker routes or zero emission double-deckers between now and Christmas. And those two services will start with their electric vehicles in the last quarter of 2018. So we're starting now our first central London double-deck electric route contracts. So, um, so that's 
understand why. There's a tube strike on Thursday um, from Aslef, and um, we have to put out 200 more buses. It's going to be really good. There's a chance once again. <laughs> now you're going to say, you're going to say to me, that's just your sort of nostalgic thing coming out. But it isn't. Let me tell you really why we're doing this. Because actually there are four and a half million passengers on the underground every day, and 200 buses isn't going to scratch the surface of it. But the public does like to know that we're trying. So when we deploy our 200 buses, not a prayer of carrying four and a half million people, but there is a prayer of letting the public realize that TFL is doing everything it can to try and help. And that's why the old vehicles and the multicolored vehicles are so important in this. Because if these were just ordinary red buses, the public wouldn't tell the extras from the schedule. By using our historical vehicles from all of you, and by using vehicles from outside London, the multicolored, <coughs> multi-shape thing gives the public an, a feeling impression about how hard we're working to, um, to improve their journey. What's great is the traffic's dreadful, but there are passengers who sit on an RT on the 25 all the way from Oxford Circus to Stratford take about three hours. And they get off and say, that was brilliant. <laughs> and they write in, they write in and say, thank you for doing this. It's really been done. It's been done. It's been so the public is really important. You know, the rights and wrongs of the industrial action are, are not going to go into. The public is inconvenienced. We're doing what we can. It's only a scratch on the surface. You'd need thousands of buses. There are thousands of buses to deal with it. So, um, so that's, what, that's why we do it. It's also fair to say we are respectful uh, of our past. So here's some pictures that we all know all about. So as we did take uh, the battle bus uh, to the Menning Gate uh, and ran the various parts of France and Belgium from uh, World War One. Sam Mullins and I laid a wreath um, at the Menning Gate uh, it's in 2014, uh, and the bus drove through the gate, uh, and so on, which, was, which was fabulous. And also in the picture, um, this is uh, Russell Square 777, commemorating 10 years since the bombings on the underground on, on the bus on the 7th of uh, July. The driver there with his hand to his eye is the driver of the bus in the, uh, in the explosion itself. And I think one of the things that TFL does very well is always to remember its past. The fact that there's a museum, the fact that you're all friends of the museum, uh, I think uh, we acknowledge is uh, really helpful in us uh, respecting our past and making sure that we use all the knowledge from our past um, for the future. Um, so it's one or two other adventures. Um, here we are in New York with New Route Master, um, with two red pictures in the bottom one for fun. Um, if you didn't know this, you do know it now. The Australian rules for weight distribution are completely different to the British ones. Therefore, you want to have a bus this big, this heavy in Australia, it has to have twin steering axles and a single rear axle, not what we would do the other way around. That's because the Australian weight distribution rules are inverse to ours. Back to New York. So there was this plan to take the new route master to New York to move David Cameron and Prince Harry from the helicourt to a launch for the Great Britain uh, campaign. <coughs> so bus was shipped, I was shipped, a number of us were shipped, and I found myself in some heated uh, debate with my very good friend I was only talking to today, a wonderful lady, Jeanette Sadek Khan, who was the Transport Commissioner in New York uh, when we did this. So Jeanette is fantastic, because I rang her up and said, Jeanette, I need to bring my new Routemaster bus to New York for Prince Harry and David Cameron. It's too long, too heavy, too wide and too high, and the doors are on the wrong side. <laughs> said, uh, Good job you called. Uh, uh, okay, uh, let's work our way through this, shall we? Uh, well, the great thing in New York's on a grid system, so the fact the doors are on the wrong side almost makes no difference because they're all one-way streets and you can, you can go on the side. Um, then we're interested in another choice. Uh, there's a bit of a choice about who would drive it. I thought I should, but anyway. There's a bit of a thought about who should drive it. Um, and um, there's two choices, really. You can have a London bus driver who knows how to drive a new route master within a fraction of a centimetre, whose only problem is he doesn't know the way. Or you can have a New York bus driver who knows the way, but has never driven a double-decker bus right-hand drive in his life. So we had him. 
<laughs> right, first day we lost the wing mirror, the second day we hit an advertising hoarding, and there was less and less of the uh, new route master bus as we got nearer and nearer. So in fact, the final move of the day we came back, I'm not sure if you can tell in this picture, but no, no, we still got two mirrors at this stage. But um, anyway, they, we had less and less of it, and so when we finally moved Prince Harry and David uh, Cameron successfully, Prince Harry said to me, nothing gets past him, how did you get it here? On a ship, sir. Brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's fine. And the bottom picture uh, is not in New York, it's in uh, Hong Kong. Um, do you remember when New Route Master was new? There was all this bad press about the air conditioning. It doesn't have air conditioning, it has air chilling. But it's not very strong. So we thought, in the heat of the summer, we'd go to Hong Kong. We took the press on it. My God. <laughs> Talk about sweating your assets. This bus was full of very, very damp uh, press people, as we're trying to give this great impression about um, about about bus in London. It was a huge success. Boris, as ever, was just magic. And there was something I found out. We went on the Star Ferry with all the press people and so on. I never realised there was a dress uniform for the captain of the Star Ferry in Hong Kong. It's all white, you know, like for the peaked cap and medals and so on. I mean, you know, most of the time they're all in their jeans and t-shirts, but there is a dress white uniform for the captain of the Star Ferry in Hong Kong. Magic. And the Star Ferry was like this, because wherever Boris went, all the press went. So, <laughs> all the time. Um, some things for the future. I've um, been testing this, this increasingly uh, future opportunity to the moment when we close bus stops, when we need to change the timetables and so on. Men in vans have to go around and change them all. Now it's increasingly possible to do it electronically from world headquarters, press of a button, change the times. Um, uh, and those times can be real times, they can be um, schedule times, they can be anything you want. And, and the technology is moving. Big step forward to be able to change all that information on bus stops. Um, electronically, what's the drawback? The drawback is, of course, it's more expensive. You don't get the clarity that you get with print. There's all sorts of lighting reflection and so on, but Doug is working on it. And um, so we're, we're very, very uh, interested in that sort of, um, in that sort of uh, technology. <coughs> and we're also keen to get some uh, bigger bus information out onto some of the <coughs> places in bus stations and so on. Amongst my favorite times in the seven years I've done this job was year of the bus in 2014. Um, that's as close to 1956, I think, as I can, um, I can remember. I don't think I'll ever forget that picture of how we completely took over Regent Street and how about 450,000 people, 440,000 of whom didn't know the show was on, just walked around the corner at Oxford Circus or Piccadilly Circus and saw this beautiful lineup from Horse Bus to uh, New Route Master. It was a glorious day, and to take over that and give so much pleasure to so many people, I think is just um, remarkable. And uh, it was one of the happiest days that I can remember, because when it all finally came together and they were all lined up, and kids in the cab with the steering wheel and take people, tourists having their pictures taken and so on. And I know some people had some criticisms about which vehicles we'd chosen and which vehicles we hadn't chosen. The truth is the vehicles were chosen for a number of special reasons, none the least of which in some cases to appreciate the hard work that some of the people and their owners had put in over the, over the years. And I know there wasn't an RF there, and I know there were three new route masters and so on, but I promise you that the choice of the vehicles was a balance between historical, you know, sort of straightforward historical um, <coughs> explanation, uh, but also making sure that certain vehicles that were really very important um, were on display and were available and, um, and the sorts of vehicles that people uh, wanted to see. So it was really, it really was very, very important. So, nearly there, the future. Um, <coughs> these are all really tricky. Um, the funding is the big one. So the government took away TfL's revenue support grant in the Comprehensive Spending Review of September 2015, which means that it was immediately halved and next year it goes to zero. So unlike very many cities in the civilized world, London gets no central taxpayers' money for revenue support at all, zero. Um, the bus network loses 650 million pounds a year so before we even start, with no government support, we have to find 650 million for the gap between the uh, repairs revenue and 
the cost of operating it. We also get no money for roads. In fact, if you have a car in London and you buy road tax, 100% of it goes to the Treasury, zero comes to London. Um, so funding is going to get very much tighter over the next um, few years. Uh, and maintaining all of the things that people want us to do will get harder and harder. So you will see us um, uh, struggling to do all of the things that everybody wants done as quickly as they want them done because we will just have to um, work very hard to make sure that we're getting the best, um, best value for money. Air quality we already talked about, um, but I'll just mention it one more time. Uh, a, a heat map of the city showing levels of pollution is frightening. You wouldn't go out. Uh, and transport's not the, not the only cause, but the mayor is absolutely determined. So 23rd of October, a T charge. Your vehicle is 2005 or earlier. You would have to pay extra to be in the central zone. And we're consulting now on uh, a wider option, low emission zone, um, and so on. The population. The last time this many people lived in London was 1939. It's growing at the rate of two underground trains a week. All those people are coming into London, need homes, have jobs, need to travel between them. And that growing population, 2030, there'll be 10 million people here. The difference between now and 2030 is a city the size of Birmingham. So I'm not saying people in Birmingham are coming here, but that's the sort of scale of it. The growth in London's population is the size of Birmingham, which is extraordinary. Go anywhere tonight, go up to a high building, count the number of cranes, more cranes here than in Shanghai. Every crane, a building site. That building site already is thrown on the network. Construction vehicles bringing materials in, tippers <coughs> taking spoil away. When the buildings are finished, it'll be full of people. All those people have to travel there, whether they're residences or offices, they need to travel to or from them. And they all want their photocopy of paper delivered, and their Amazon parcels delivered and their rubbish taken away. Every crane already a strain on the network. That strain will morph over time. Every one of them um, an extra strain on the roads and on the transport um, system. <coughs> growth in outer London, still strong. That's where the bus really comes into its own. Uh, growth in suburban London on bus services is, is, is good. Private car is still an alternative in outer London. We are absolutely determined to not let it take uh, any more hold than it already has. Uh, and work very hard. Zone 1 and Crossrail, you've seen what we've been doing. We've been thinning out the bus service in Zone 1. Uh, in anticipation of Crossrail, there's a bit more to come. And why are we doing that? The, the ridership is falling for the reasons we talked about before. When Crossrail arrives, actually there'll be a wholesale change in the way east-west movements take place uh, across London. Now, of course, there'll still be bus services, of course, because the Crossrail is not ideal for uh, everybody. There'll still be people who can't get to stations, that the hop on and off of the bus and so on. So don't worry, there'll still be plenty, plenty of bus services, but there will have to be some real changes um, in terms of the service volume. And then finally, um, which is always fun to talk about, um, I have to be very careful in my capacity as the Taxi and Private Hire Licensing Authority for London. <laughs> we have this thing called Market Disruption by Technology or Uber for short. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to say anything about that, but it's what is happening. Okay, we talked about how the whole bus ridership thing is affected by the mobile phone in your pocket. Well, that's where the market disruption by technology is as well. So networks are getting optimized. The young are using their phones to make journey decisions, shopping decisions, lifestyle planning decisions, and so on. And it may well be the case that the big double-decker bus service that runs every 15 or 10 or 7 minutes might not, only, might not only be the answer for the needs of some of the people, especially the young. Um, and we have to be alert to that. We have to think about, in policy terms, what does that mean for us? Because if people want to run something between a taxi private hire vehicle and a bus, a little bus, demand responsive and are prepared to um, pay for it. What's TfL's role in that? Is it to prevent them from operating in order to protect what we already have? Or is it our job to allow it and enable it uh, and step back from providing services that are currently provided at a cost to the taxpayer? 
Uh, that's a big question for organisations like ours. Um, quite a lot of that will be addressed in the Mayor's Transport Strategy, currently out for consultation. We're in the last week, I think, of mm -hmm. um, consultation. Please send in your uh, comments. But there's no doubt that this market disruption by technology, this Uber thing we've seen, is just one case. There'll be hundreds of cases. And everything that applies to passengers also applies to freight and delivery. It's the next generation of little white vans will come with onboard connectivity. So you buy a van, you get able to just log in. And whilst you're using your van, of course you're a plumber, um, or you're um, um, uh, doing some other job, you'll be able to buy into a system that offers you parcels to collect and deliver, offers you other things you can do with your van. So the, the connectivity thing will be amazing. And the vehicles will come with this stuff fitted. You won't stick it on the windscreen. The vehicle will already be connected. <coughs> and there's a further argument you can run, if you choose to, that the data that vehicles can collect will be worth more than the van. So if you remember a time when mobile phones were new, go off the train at Waterloo or Victoria, they'd give you a mobile phone for nothing if you'd sign up for a 36-month contract. And that's because the 36 months' worth of your airtime is worth more than the phone. Same with vehicles. There's a real prospect that vehicles will be much cheaper because actually the value of the data that the vehicles export will be worth more to somebody than actually the aluminium and the glass that it's made of. So just to take an example, out here in Wellington Street, and let's just pretend every vehicle in Wellington Street here is connected. Every pulse of data that car is vehicle is generating is worth something. If they've all got their windscreen wipers on, it's probably raining granularity of that level of weather information is of value to somebody. And everything from weather, temperature, air quality, skid resistance, noise, everything that the vehicles are capable of measuring and transmitting as data has a value to somebody. So we could have a situation where that level of connectivity is worth a lot of money to somebody. And the trick is working out who and, um, and so on. And that's before, that's just connectivity, that's before we get to automation. Because, of course, if you bought a new car, a decent one anyway, in the recent year or so, you've already got new levels of automation. If you've got new, if you've got new Mercedes, BMW, whatever, you've probably got dynamic cruise control. You've probably got lane keeping assist. You've probably got automatic parking. So automation isn't sort of binary, you know, with or without driver. It's incremental. So if you've just bought a car in the last year or so, the fact that you can put it on the motorway, flip the dynamic cruise control on, and it'll stay in the lane, it'll follow the corners, it'll do the speed of the car in front up to a maximum that you've set, you're already experiencing a level of automation that's built into vehicles now. So it's only a relatively small step to um, complete automation. Now the world, is in a, the world hasn't made its mind up where it's going to arrive. Some cities say the first level of automation will be a sort of driverless Uber in the suburbs probably replacing mainstream services. People come out of a restaurant or a bar, vehicle takes them home. Um, other, other cities like Singapore will tell you the first autonomous vehicles will be buses, because buses run on fixed routes. So the only knowledge the bus needs to have is that one, about its fixed route. Um, I don't have the answer to that, but it's <coughs> fascinating, and um, it will be uh, really exciting, I think, for the, I think it'll be really exciting for the future. Last thought on autonomous vehicles. You can use this at home, feel free. Ask your families, drinking companions, people on the golf course, <coughs> anybody you like. A couple of really interesting things about um, autonomous vehicles. Autonomous vehicles would be very much safer than manually driven vehicles. Like autopilots on planes kill far fewer people than pilots do. So let's just pretend uh, in our automated area, let's just pretend um, that instead of the 15 or 1,600 people a year that are killed on the roads of Great Britain by humans, 15, 1,600 people a year that society tolerates as deaths, as the price of their personal mobility, price of getting their goods delivered, price of <coughs> living in the modern world. Let's pretend instead of killing 1,700, 1,600 people a year by humans, autonomous vehicles only kill 200. Does society say, that's a phenomenal improvement. 1,200, 1,300 people who would be dead are alive. Would they say, 
250 deaths by machines. If this was a factory, you'd go to jail. So I'm really interested in what society will do with that. Will it say it's a big improvement? Will it refuse to tolerate 250 by machines? Will it tolerate 15, 1,600 pounds, 1,600 people by, by, by heat? And there's a second one. You can try this. That's what I told you. Let's just pretend every vehicle in London is autonomous. Here's a question for you to think about. When you leave here tonight, every vehicle in London is autonomous. When you get to the road here, are you going to press the button and wait for the green man? Or are you going to walk straight out in front of the traffic knowing it will automatically stop for you? <laughs> <laughs> so while you're thinking about that, I'd just like to say it's been fabulous to be with you. Thank you very much indeed for indulging me in that little canter through my own memories, which are personal to me. Uh, if you enjoyed them at all, uh, I'm, I'm extremely grateful. Uh, and just like to say that, isn't it great, here in 2017, we can be running in service Heritage Route Masters in London uh, for the tourists and allow some of our friends with their historic vehicles uh, to participate from time to time as well. Who would have thought when Prince Marshall first tentatively walked his dog in Green Park uh, that it would come to this? Thank you very much. Indeed, that was really quite something, wasn't it, ladies and gentlemen, from quite a lot of fun at the beginning to some really quite thought-provoking things at the end. Um, we've got ten minutes or so for questions. It will help both our listeners on the World Wide Web and also those sitting behind you here, uh, if you kindly wait for a mic. Uh, those at the front, Graham, I'll try and pass this one to. So who's going to jump in? Right. Andrew. Yes. So I'm just, um, while you're giving the mic to Andrew, I've just realised about the people listening on the web. Thank you. Andrew. Um, Andrew Braddock, formerly with TfL, London Transport, and various others over many years. Um, I'm sorry to be a killjoy, Leon, but you don't have the largest fleet of electric buses in the world. Oh, did I say world? I didn't think there are 39 yes, yes, cities yes, yes. around the world that have larger yes. electric bus fleets, yep. 21 of them significantly more than yours, because they kept and modernised their tri-bus fleets. <laughs> <laughs> what a choice. What, of course, is hugely significant is that London once did have the largest fleet of electric buses in the world when there were 1,870 whatever of them. Um, really, really interesting studies have been done across Europe recently, particularly in Zurich, that show very clearly if you are concerned about air quality, if you're concerned about whole life costs, if you're concerned about getting it right, you will invest in trolley buses because the Flash charging needs probably 15 houses worth of electricity to make it work. And if you can show me any route in London where your eight or nine minutes layover is still there and it's not consumed in the 42 minute late running of the average London bus, blah, blah, blah. Uh, overnight charging like Waterloo is fine until the contract changes. You maybe need to move the depot, then you've got to move all the kit with it. The efficiency, as the Zurich study shows, of in motion charging is absolutely phenomenal. Get the wires up. Why aren't you doing that in London before you leave? <laughs> well, I was, I was looking forward to the question, but I've got to the question now. Which is, well, I'll, I'll try and do it before I leave, Andrew. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> the point Andrew makes is entirely right. Uh, and indeed, all of the opportunity, you know, some of the cities in Europe um, are leading us because their overhead wires are still there. We've got cases of electric buses um, popping their pantographs up and getting a top up charge during the lunch break. And the, the, the whole range of opportunities um, and of course because the wires have always been there there's no um, there's no issues with the residents about putting them up because they've been there all the time so uh, I echo what Andrew says entirely about the great pity that it is um, that we don't have overhead wires that we could um, we could plug into now and um, it's very interesting to see what other cities are doing for sure. Okay, anybody else? Right at that. Um, does London have the right way of tendering its bus services, oh. or could there be a better way? Oh, Keith Nason, for those of you who are interested. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't mention who he was, but I will. <laughs> uh, on the tendering, as you know, five years plus two years extension, every route's a contract, whether it's the 631, which is one bus in one direction once a day, or whether it's the 25, which is a bus every two minutes, 24 hours a day. 
Um, pretty well everybody in the world, and many of the major accountancy firms, have been to us to have a look and see if there's a way to improve it. And very rarely do they find improvements uh, over, over the current system, which is expensive to do because every route's a contract and therefore everyone has to be that sort of big machine <laughs> doing all this um, stuff. But it does mean um, that unlike in some other markets, um, there are very low levels of challenge because everybody who might be a bit unhappy with the results today has got skin in the game for tomorrow because of the effect of this. So by doing it route by route, what do we achieve? We achieve a one in five year check that the thing is doing what it should be doing. Secondly, we have a one in five year uh, check that it's, um, that it's value for money. Um, <coughs> and uh, whilst there are other ways of doing it, batch them up by areas, um, by garages, um, each one of them brings in another sort of complication. Um, and you could, have, one of the things we don't want is something that ossifies the network, so that everything just stays the same. So there has to be adequate competition. One of the drawbacks with anything bigger than a route is that the smaller operators struggle to get a foothold because if things are let in big batches, they may not have the financial resources or the capacity. So by doing it route by route, um, and by doing it the way we do it, uh, we have found that consistently we, the market has stayed relatively frothy, the prices have stayed relatively uh, competitive, and there's no shortage of bidders. Very rarely do we get a route where there's only one bidder. I'm certainly not going to tell you what they are. But very rarely uh, do we get a, um, uh, one with one bidder. And every study that's ever been done about other ways of doing it um, uh, brings you back to brings you back to the same to the same conclusion. It is a bit odd, and I was the first one to say this, that the, the number we put on the front of the bus as a marketing device to tell people where it goes is used as a unit for a contract. Because as I said, the smallest one is very, very small, and the biggest one is very large. And it's funny to have a system that treats them all uniformly, even though there's a great, great difference in scale. But for Keith's question, which is a very good question, is uh, we're not wedded to the system. We often review it, we often get external people review it, we're often challenged by other people, and the system that we have um, uh, always comes to, out to be the best value for money in the trade-off between the cost of doing it and, uh, and the prices and so on. Uh, the risks for the workforce have been largely eliminated by Tupi, so as routes change then people don't lose their jobs, they have the right to move with their uh, uh, with the new contract, um, and it has kept um, the balance going um, across London. And so, so, so I think it's, I think it's in good shape. Uh, it's fair to say that the evaluation of the contracts has become much more difficult, because while we, when we first started, we were putting in prices for new, for used buses, then new and used buses, now different length buses, now existing refurbished electric, hydrogen, Euro six diesel, you know. And the evaluation of all of these has become progressively um, more complicated. Uh, but the team, which is chaired by me, um, sits down every two weeks to evaluate it. We're doing some tomorrow, in fact. H2, H3, tomorrow, 268, anybody's interested? Um, Arriva, you should be. The, uh, <laughs> so, we're evalu so we're evaluating those um, uh, tomorrow. Uh, and the process is very rigorous. Um, and. Uh, documentation is very well done, uh, the challenge is very good, um, and as I say, it's worked for us since about 1985, and um, I've been there long enough to have done them all, because it's really good. Okay, time for one more, we, or two, two hands for us, we'll take these two, perhaps that's easiest to do, gentlemen there, then to John Parkin. Hi, um, have you looked at the implications of um, uh, transferring people from a double, one double-decker bus to several on-demand Uber vehicles? Um, so, uh, I think the question is heading towards efficiency and the use of space and drones and so on. Um, so, uh, I think look, there's nothing more efficient in moving than double-decker bus. Well, I'll, an articulated single-decker bus, please. Yeah. Um, uh, high capacity um, mainstream <gasps> are very efficient in the movement of people. For sure, but I think we are just facing 
uh, in the modern world a greater demand for more door-to-door -door transport because private vehicles are door-to-door -door, and where demand responsive is to trying to get in is somewhere that's cheaper than a taxi or a private hire vehicle um, but is more convenient and more door-to-door -door than um, conventional bus services ever, ever can be. The problem is, of course, is that if you divide them all up into small vehicles, then you just have a very large number of small vehicles and the streets and the streets don't go anywhere. But I think it could be argued that uh, on top of the mainstream corridors where there's lots of demand, there are places, especially on the fringes of London, where actually the sort of mainstream single-deck or double-deck vehicle um, is only providing some of what's required. Um, and that in some areas the demand responsive stuff. But I, I, I entirely agree with you. It's not evidently for congested zone one type places. It's much more likely for those places that we struggled with. You know, we struggle with places like Epsom Hospital um, because you know the the the, um, the way in which the London administrative boundary is written. You know, there's places like Banstead and Epsom and so on which are in and out of London, even though one you know, serves the other. So there are. I think there are places where we struggle. And, we tr and this is us trying very hard not to say one size fits all. This is us not saying you have to have a single decker bus running every 15 minutes on a fixed route from door to door, from, from terminus to terminus, um, because uh, that doesn't satisfy, doesn't satisfy the demand. So we're trying to be a bit flexible, and the market, I think, is telling us that they want to be a bit flexible. But you're transferring people from the main route to residential roads where you're putting in uh, speed restrictions mm. um, and you could actually end up with more traffic accidents. Mm, mm, you could, you could. Um, I, I think it's also fair to say that uh, we, um, well, we have to watch. We have to watch very carefully. It's, it's the way in which things are developing, um, and you're right. There are there are there are consequences for it. Um, but I think um, that there's, this, that what's driving this is the evidence of the companies that do journey planning about the actual journeys that people want to make. And the journeys people want to make are not between railway stations and railway stations, or between bus stations and bus stations. They are between front doors and other front doors. And that we didn't used to have visibility of that. We, we knew when they joined our network or when they left it. But what we now have increasingly, what the journey plan people have, is real origin and destination information about the journeys people really want to make. Um, and if those journeys are being made in private vehicles of some sort, then a flexible, demand-responsive, um, <coughs> shared ride could be better. So choosing these words carefully. <coughs> right. Last question here, because we're going to go outside and we can carry on informally uh, over a drink. John. You're quite right, Liam, about the... You're quite right, Liam, about the availability of smartphone apps yep. and um, telling you when your next bus is. And so I use it myself. You look at it and it says, next bus due in two minutes. So you're going on the road, you turn the corner, and you see the dreaded yellow hood on the bus stop. And I can't get the bus because it tells you to go to the next bus of the previous stop, by which time that two minutes has elapsed. Do you agree that more effort should be made to provide temporary stops, as used to happen in the past? Bearing in mind, for the Mayor of TfL, every journey matters. Indeed. <laughs> well, John, of course, you, you, you remind me of every journey matters every evening on the internet, <laughs> uh, which I'm very grateful. And um, uh, yes, you're right. Actually, technology will help us because the same that we were talking about with the um, e-ink stuff on timetable frames, we have got a prototype flag working the same way, which is to be able to turn it on or off. So it'll look like a flag and you can flick a switch and it will appear to have a yellow hood on it. But the, that, that's not just cosmetic because the very act of turning it off will connect to the journey planner stuff as well. So it won't let you go to a stop that we've closed because we'll close it for the purpose of the, um, for the, of the real time information as well. But you also had a point about temporary stops, um, which uh, is, entirely, is entirely right. We should make more effort to provide proper temporary stops where mainstream stops are taken out for, um, for any reason. Uh, it's got much worse over time because we just currently have to close many more stops because there's more intervention on the carriageway. There's incidents, episodes, and stuff uh, that goes on. So, so dealing with it got a, has got a bit harder. But it, if your question is, should we put more effort into providing alternative stops for ones that we have to close, yes, we should. Okay, I'm Boz Lacey, and I'm one of the people in the audience who heard Leon talk for the Omnibus Society at his presidential address last year. 
Um, I'm not certain it was the second presentation, but I have to say, even if it was, I enjoyed it the second time around as much, if not more, as the first time. Um, it's interesting, I guess, that it's a retrospective, and it comes at obviously a fairly significant point in Leon's professional career. Um, retirement, of course, is a relative term, as I'm sure you realise, and uh, many of us have discovered that it doesn't mean idleness, it just means perhaps, we hope, Less rather money. more time to do the things we want to do than the things we have to do. Um, I have to say my slight concern is that are we going to get, as managing director for surface transport, someone who not only delivers the professional goods, but also shares the passion for London Transport's heritage, which Leon obviously does. So with that thought, I will just ask you ladies and gentlemen to express our appreciation. <laughs>